Hey, welcome to the Key Code 4K Workflow panel. Uh, today we're streaming live from Ray's Boathouse, just north of downtown Seattle, and the view here is amazing. Well, the view out there, the view here, it's all right, but the view out there is amazing. Um, now, you'd expect a, a 4K Workflow panel to be streamed in 4K, but um, this face, not 4K compatible, so we've, we've dumbed it down a little bit. Uh, but today we're going to touch on three aspects of high-res production workflows. We're going to talk about acquisition, storage, and distribution. And our crack staff at Keycode Media has put together a bunch of questions for me to ask our expert panelists here, and I'm going to introduce them right now. Immediately to my right, we've got Bryce Button, AJA Product Marketing Manager. Welcome. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Next, we have Matt Stamos, Solution Architect from Quantum. Thank you. Thanks for being here, Matt. And Eli Blackman, last but not least, Senior Field Marketing Manager at Elemental Technologies. Thanks for having Welcome, me. Welcome, gentlemen. Now, before we get started, we want to let the audience know that this webcast is meant to be interactive. So if you have any questions, comments, concerns, you can uh, tweet us at hashtag 4KCrazy. We'll be taking questions at the end of the uh, stream, see what we can answer, see what you guys come up with to stump us or intrigue us. and. Uh, other than that, let's get going. Uh, first questions are going to be for you, Bryce. First of all, welcome. Thank you very We're much. We're all big fans of AJA. We love what you do. Um, I'd like to talk about the uh, the beginning of the 4K process, which is capture. And, and the first question that comes up is, what are the major challenges for 4K signal distribution? Uh, well, at AJA, of course, we do make uh, the Scion camera for full-on 4K capture, including Ultra HD. Uh, and then we work through the entire pipeline chain. So we provide converters, because you, of course, have to take 4K signals, and for a lot of people, they're still working with HD equipment. They need to utilize that. Everything from fiber to up-down cross-conversion. Uh, we also move into streaming through our editing products and, of course, the editing process. Mm -hmm. uh, and in fact, at IBC, we even announced our first HEVC card, uh, which are going into OEM applications so we can start getting the stuff to the home because that's one of the biggest hurdles at the moment. And when do you think that'll be released to the general public? Well, that type of stuff will be used in products almost immediately with okay. various partners uh, because it needs to get into the broadcasting head end uh, so it can get from there to, to the home. Outstanding. So, first generation 4K signal flow. Uh, when it was first done, it was achieved through quad 3G HD SDI. That is a um, for those who aren't familiar with it, um, can you explain how it works and when will that quad 3G technology become redundant uh, with the introduction of 12G? Well, 12G has actually been out there for some time with some of our competitors. Uh, the reality is that the 3G standard is still very much the standard. Uh, and it's called quad because you're using four of these cables. And it's also a nice multiplier when it comes from the HD base. Uh, 12G is something we've obviously looked at. It hasn't taken off in a huge way within the industry, largely because the real end goal was probably going to be 20G in terms of dealing with the needs of 8K and HDR workflows and color depth and all that kind of thing. Uh, so for the moment, uh, I think four times 3G SDI cables for professionals is still the way to go. Uh, it integrates with the workflows and the uh, environments that are already in place. Uh, and it's something that you can route quite simply in that type of thing. Probably going to be more of a move to IP type broadcasting that'll occur quicker than a full on 12G implementation. Oddly, you'd mention that. You, you must have seen these questions. Now, that's my next question. Mm -hmm. um, latest buzz for live production is the move to IP based signal distribution, moving away. Mm -hmm. from SDI. How do you see that playing out in 4K? You just, you just touched on it briefly. But yeah, it's already occurring, of course. Um, yeah. There are, at uh, IBC 2015 in Amsterdam, Newtech made their big announcement in terms of their new standard NDI. Uh, that's an open protocol. And because of that, all our current cards, for instance, the Kona cards, IO 4Ks, which handle 4K, uh, will be able to be utilized and there's no extra payment or anything like that for, for our users. Uh, so, so that'll go into the stream. The big gap between using IP for full-on broadcast versus what's largely occurring at the moment, which is uh, over the top, is there's a big difference between having sports, for instance, which needs to arrive at home at the moment it's going on, yeah. and what effectively happens with most IP systems at this moment in time, where there's a bit of a delay, so the, the OTT stuff makes more sense for that, where it's not as critical. Uh, so we're living in an in-between stage at the moment. Um, the industry is looking at it obviously very seriously. 
the big issue there is that most of the systems are proprietary. So Sony has their IP standard, a number of other manufacturers have theirs. Uh, we certainly look at this as a company that builds bridge project, uh, products yeah. as probably a, a good environment for us to get involved in, um, since we've always been very good at that kind of thing, getting from point A to point B. Do you see it as, as possibly a, uh, a personnel matter too? You've got <clears throat> a lot of young folks coming up in the, in the industry that, mm -hmm. have, that are used to the, the current technology. And if you go around a lot of the call letter stations, stuff like that, you've got a lot of grisly old veterans that are used to plugging mm -hmm. that cable in and going. Do you see it more as, as just the, the younger crowd coming in be able to adopt quicker and move up, uh, resistance from the top going down, or is this just going to kind of roll forward and, and, and progress? I think it'll be a natural evolution. Uh, you know, basically what you're getting at there is that there's a difference between the IT crowd and the traditional broadcast yeah. crowd. Uh, <coughs> both of them coexist at this point in time, and, and that kind Barely, of... Barely, but they, yeah, they're, there's what they do. It's happening very quickly. Um, and so, uh, you know, even on that basis, in the last year alone, we've introduced HD-based T products for conversion, which mm -hmm. can handle HD and, you know, eventually uh, elements of 4K. And that's just using standard Ethernet cables going point to point. Mm -hmm. So there's no doubt it's on. It's a more affordable yeah. architecture in general. Um, and I think we'll see a lot of that evolution in the next couple of years. We got nods of agreement from, from the rest of the group. Uh, what trends are you seeing with 4K recording options, codecs, outboard devices, et cetera, et cetera? There are quite a few ways to go. You know, uh, 4K has obviously been with us for quite some time, um, and that's largely on that purely acquisition front, mm -hmm. the camera. Uh, there's always been a big gap, though, between what camera manufacturers put out there and what the rest of us can deal with. So, for instance, a lot of camera manufacturers have never made editing systems, so it really wasn't their headache what happened sure. post-camera. Um, that being the reality, Obviously, pure uncompressed 4K is a massive amount of data to handle. And in practice, uh, we've seen raw workflows, we've seen various compression standards. Um, we've chosen to go largely with ProRes okay. because you're looking at HD type bandwidth for 4K um, production. And the ProRes uh, codecs, all the way Ari's using them, of course, in their cameras, are they visually indistinguishable from the original anyway? Um, and so the sign, for instance, has got ProRes 4444, and you, you won't be able to tell the difference between that and an AJ Raw uh, file that's been worked on in mm -hmm. post. So those compression standards are reality, and on the far end of the other chain, uh, when it comes to what Elemental is doing, etc., obviously that type of thing kicks in on the compression side for home delivery, and that's taken a bit of time to arrive at, but it's here now, and that's. HEVC and H.265 <coughs> I was walking formats. through Best Buy yesterday and, and Samsung has this gorgeous curved screen, yes. 4K monitor for under two grand. I was looking at that and thinking, wow, that'd be nice, but what, what am I truly going to watch in 4K? We'll, we'll touch on that mm -hmm. um, towards the end, but you're right, it is, it, it's here and it's, it's going to become more prevalent. Um, question, resolution or frame rate? Uh, which is most important? Now, uh, Nintendo, for example, they go for high frame rate. Yes. Xbox and PlayStation, it's all about resolution. Mm -hmm. So, are either one of them right? What, where do you stand? They're all right depending upon what you're trying to achieve. Okay. Uh, so from the broadcast point of view, which is where a lot of our business obviously clearly sits, um, it's about frame rate. So in terms of the testing that the networks have done, uh, they've got to look at it from the practical business model, which is where are we going to implement 4K and where's the money at? Well, the reality for quite some time has been iTunes is out there, Netflix is out there, Amazon stuff is out there, and that works fine for episodic shows and that type of thing. But if you're doing broadcast, your real money is in sports and news. And so you look at that, and in testing, they've already realized that for the, from the audience point of view, uh, frame rate rules. So it doesn't matter how great the resolution is, if it looks like it's stuttering or you can't kick in for a replay and it's nice and smooth. Mm -hmm. So the practical end result is almost all the implementations going on right now, and they've started in the UK with Premier League. You're going to start seeing it next year with the Olympics, etc. Okay. It'll definitely be 60p. Uh, so 50 and 60p is the reality there, uh, and it's it's a simple thing of audience testing. It's, you can look at the resolution, but if it looks stuttery, people are not happy. Sure. Uh, and so that seems to be where it's landing up, whereas for episodic, it could be as low as 24 frames per second if you wanted to. Get that grainy movie look to yes. it, yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Um, can you tell us a little bit about the strategy and techniques for up conversion to 4K? We're going to have a lot of 4K productions that are going to want to mix in HD assets with their 4K, so can you touch on up conversion for us? Yeah, that's a real, very real problem. It was one of our biggest announcements at IBC is our new uh, frame synchronizer and 4K up converter. Because again, I can go to a network if I'm working for the network and say, hey, we should be broadcasting this sport in 4K, and they'll go, great. What are we going to do about <laughs> all of our highlights that are in our highlights HD, in HD? Yeah. The fact that the advertising is certainly still arriving in HD, yeah. et cetera, et cetera, uh, and that's why we introduced the FS3. So we've yeah. had uh, a lot of experience already in scaling, and the FS3, for instance, features uh, adaptive scaling, uh, which is absolutely stunning from HD to 4K. And those kind of tools are going to have to be there to move any serious entity into the 4K universe for a perpetual 4K broadcast. The next question is, uh, what were the first uses of 4K you've seen in broadcast? I mean, you kind of touched on that. It looks mm -hmm. like it's it's going to be sports and news are really going to be the big push coming across the pond here right. to the states, and we'll see 4K in in news and sports. And then, where do you see it catching up from there? Who's who's next to bat after that? Is it? Well, I think it's you know it obviously started with cinema. Period. Uh, you know, digital cinema has been something that most of us have lived with for reality almost a decade now. Uh, red cameras have been around forever and they've you know, had 5K, etc. Uh, so the cinema was a natural place to begin with broadcast that's happening now and again in sports. Uh, in terms of, of other elements, live events are huge. We do a lot of stuff uh, where our equipment is used for live concerts. Katy okay. Perry has got a wall. A video she's got to dance in front of. Uh, that type of thing uh, has certainly pushed 4K along. Um, so you, uh, it's really across the board. Uh, but live events are, have been a big drive. It's almost an AV type market, but it's very real and there's big money in it. Um, so those are elements. I don't, I don't know what. I mean, do you really want to see the Rolling Stones in 4K, though? I mean, is that is that <laughs> really the best use for that technology? Because possibly not. But I'm not <laughs> going to get into subjectivity. Then uh, you might want to see what's behind them in 4K, though, there if you're go. sitting in a huge stadium. If there's anybody dancing on the sides, we're good to go. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> moving to editorial, having, even Avid Media Composer now supports 4K natively. Uh, how are users achieving 4K ingest and 4K monitoring? Um, so it depends how you go about it, but for, for typical editing scenarios, obviously we're one of the major manufacturers of I.O. products. And on that end, we have desktop PCIe cards, okay. uh, like the Kona 4, and then we have Thunderbolt. So Thunderbolt was a big deal there. Uh, Thunderbolt 2 allowed us to create the I.O. 4K, which can be utilized, of course, with a little Mac urn, uh, yeah. or it can the be utilized with trash can. the trash can, or it can be <laughs> utilized with your, your MacBook. Um, so that reality has been with us for a while, and I produce a lot of the videos for our company. We've been doing 4K production on that end with those I.O. devices for three years or so. Um, so an easy start. conversion then? Yeah, it's fairly, fairly straightforward. And in fact, uh, on, on the iMac, for instance, and even some of the HP machines, you can do basic 4K display out um, just off the display port mm -hmm. or, or Thunderbolt port. Uh, the reason to still have I.O. devices is all about sync and locked frame rate. So some people don't necessarily understand if you just plug in a display from your computer, are you actually seeing true frame rate? Uh, and that's why an I.O. device to this day is, is still essential, because it's got to be locked to those actual frame timings. Understood. Um, to finish up, and we'll move on, but of course, this is a panel discussion, so I'm hoping you guys will all discuss. Uh, can you speak a little about HDR and 10-bit for me? You mentioned it before we started off, off camera that uh, mm -hmm. it was of interest and I, I want to ask you to throw it out and, and tell us about uh, HDR and 10-bit. Well, yeah, it's, it's an int intriguing move. When I worked at Autodesk, we always were dealing with HDR for cinema, uh, open EXR standards, all sorts of things. Um, now it's becoming a bigger element. Uh, Adobe showed, for instance, Premiere with HDR workflows with one of our I.O. 4Ks at IBC, et cetera. And what that really is about is seeing more color depth. So in scenarios where that is more important than frame rate, for instance, and also for smaller sets, because you know, one of the big catches with 4K for the home environment is you're kind of wasting your time buying anything under 55 inches. Um, you're not going to see it. You're yeah, not, you're not going to see what's being produced. You're not really going to no. see it. So HDR is about getting much richer color depth in there, etc. 
And it was intriguing to me that with the latest OS moves, Windows 10 has got 10 bit support. The truth is, on the Mac OS, for instance, it's only with this latest version of El Capitan that you're getting 10 bit on an iMac. So those 4K and 5K iMacs weren't actually showing you more than 8 bit color before. <laughs> so even for the uh, production side, we're just slowly getting there. So <laughs> I think uh, that all comes around to the fact that I think people will make choices based upon their project needs, where stuff's going to be shown. But what's very exciting for all of us and all of us sitting here is we basically make tools uh, that now make a real 4K workflow from beginning to end possible. Uh, and that's really been the catch until this year and going into 2016. It was really hard to have a smooth pipeline. End to end, yeah. And at this point, we're pretty much there. Outstanding. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Appreciate it. I'm going to scoot over to Matt. And you, you have to look interested because I'm talking across <laughs> you. Okay? Of so you got to you so look like you're really interested. Uh, Matt Stamos, Solution Architect at Quantum. Uh, storage is by far our favorite, most exciting aspect of production <laughs> workflow. Uh, so, it, honestly, I know, I, it's Key. storage. It's, Brutal. it's exciting. But it's the water, right? It's the water of your workflow. You've got to have it. You, you've got to have it. Uh, we want to talk to you about challenges of data, bandwidth, and workflow management. All right, you ready for that? Yeah, first, for sure. First question. What is the economic impact on a production switching from HD to 4K? And I know there's a lot of people out there watching right now that yeah. are contemplating 4K, and, and now's your chance to, to convince them that's the right move to make. Well, I mean, the reality is there's obvious increases in bandwidth requirements, capacity requirements, which puts an ever-increasing strain on your storage system. You know, with our solution, we have the ability to tier. So you can tier stuff automatically off to lower cost tiers of storage, say LTO tape, cloud, or we even have um, object storage, uh, which potentially could be less expensive than, than primary storage. So again, it kind of goes back to what you were saying, depending on the workflow, depending on the customer's challenges, it could even play into the geography of the customer. Mm -hmm. They have the ability now to not necessarily simply increase their primary storage, but increase maybe their LTO tier, a tertiary disk tier, or a cloud tier, and, and offload, if you will, uh, components of their workflow that don't need the high performance uh, of primary disk. So when our when folks that are watching are, are, are thinking about this, they can still take what's existing. They can take their infrastructure and, yeah. and add to it using uh, perhaps a quantum device, still have uh, the ability to, to work in 4K, but utilize the, that capital investment they've already made and not have to clean house and go, 4K top Exactly, to and we can actually do that in a, in a single namespace. So it'll still look like that same volume on your desktop, okay. but the files could actually be living on a different tier. So you're going to look and it's going to look and feel like that same storage that you've been used to using, but you know you're going to move things off to save costs and save preserve bandwidth and preserve capacity. Uh, well, speaking of bandwidth, going beyond bandwidth, uh, how are clients dealing with the tidal wave of data? I mean, this is this is a massive, massive amount of data they're going to start bringing in. So how how are they dealing with it? You know, the reality is, is that our, our tiering can be triggered by, via an API. So in a lot of more advanced workflows, they're using media asset management tools, they're using policy-based you know, based, uh, movement of data. So stuff gets moved automatically. So you're not kind of like manually moving files off and on uh, storage. It really is happening automatically within the workflow. And because it's triggered via an API, that could be... Um, based on something as simple as a date. So if something as, some, as files age, they can be moved to lower cost tiers of storage, or it could be triggered by a third party like an API from a, a media asset management tool. Okay. Um, working with 4K uncompressed, and we're talking about massive amounts of data, so 4K uncompressed. Um, when working with critical parts of the workflow, such as finishing, uh, how do you how do you cope with that? I mean, that's, again, we're kind of, yeah. we're lingering around the same sure. subject area, but finishing is, I'm, it's where it's done, so. Well, we have a branded bundle we call the Pro 4K, Pro Solutions 4K, so it's designed to handle uncompressed 4K in a shared workflow environment. Okay. And, and so I think that's really an entry level product, but we can scale that to, to many, many users. But again, you're prioritizing your workflow based on the content, right? So the finishing guy is going to have access to a, a, you know faster, aggregated disk pools, if you will, versus uh, the, the intern who might be looking at proxy media. Right. Sure. right? So you can really um, sort of delegate the bandwidth based on the roles in the Scale workflow. Scale it based on who's using it. Okay. Exactly. Uh, until recently, 
finishing in 4K has taken a dedicated storage tier, or a DAS, uh, to separate from the rest of the workflow. Is it possible now to have everything in the same place? And I think you, you, you did just touch on that. Yeah. But can you elaborate a little more about, about uh, dedicated storage <coughs> and, and moving it all to just one? Totally. And, and I think, again, we have multiple ways to do it. So depending on the workflow environment, like a lot of traditional workflows, when they were doing finishing, they were out on an island. They were direct attached storage, and it was you know, sort of not, they were really copying and moving data just to move it between workflow stations. Uh, in, in, in our workflow solution, we can literally have a finishing guy handed off to color, and you know, uh, the same people can work on the same files at the same time. So it sounds you like know. when you're talking to the client, the ROI on that is time. Yep. I mean, if you're looking at the capital cost to do this, the ROI is the time you're going to save from what, when they had, to use, they had to move all those files back and forth and the people it took to do so, uh, having it all localized and being able to have everybody on the same machine, um, that's kind of what everybody's looking at as, as a cost savings for them. Well, and it'll, again, it'll look and feel like the same direct attached workflow, mm -hmm. only you're in a shared environment. And I think that's, you know, people are somewhat comfortable working in the, those types of environments. HD's reached a point where most high-end facilities are working in shared storage. I don't think people are going to want to go back to the days uh, of working on islands and working on uh, uh, shared storage. Direct. I take my my Lassie or whatever hard drive, I hand it to you, <laughs> I share it with you. Say here, here's my footage. That, that sneaker Sneak net. It yeah. In. yeah, there you go. Um, speed of drives, SSD. Yep. Everybody's talking SSD. Um, will we see a takeover for traditional disk anytime soon? And will it be able to perform? high enough to do so? Is it, are we going to get the performance out of it that we can from traditional disk? Well, I mean, certainly can get the performance, but I think cost is going to be a big barrier for a while. So what we're seeing in one of our one of our solutions is is having hybrid disk. Okay. So you're going to have a mix of SSDs, you're going to have a mix of, of traditional HDDs in the same chassis, and the mix might be based on the customer's capacity and bandwidth requirements. Mm -hmm. But the cool part about our solution is that it's got what we call intelligent tiering. So that files that are being commonly used are automatically moved between the SSD and the HDD tiers. So you're sort of getting the best of both worlds. You're getting right. sort of the bandwidth improvements or bandwidth increase of, of, an, of an SDD, but you're still maintaining sort of reasonable capacity by including HDDs in, the, in that same hybrid, if you will, solution. What, wh how long do you see till the industry is able to adopt that? I mean, you, you talk about doing it now, but as, as a standard, are we going to see the hybrid is, is going to be the next step and then possibly SSD in the future or? Well, I mean, hybrid includes SSD and we're seeing hybrid today in these workflows, especially um, you know, image sequence workflows for in particular um, have super high bandwidth requirements. And really in 4K, even the lightly compressed, like you were mentioning, the ProRes yep. is an incredible bandwidth requirements. So mm -hmm. I think that you're going to see hybrid solutions become more common mm -hmm. and that's definitely going to be the next stage before you see pure SSD tiers. Uh, pure SSD tiers, I think, with people with large wallets, are going to be happy to, to to spend the money on. But and we know, have no problem. That's to okay. be able to if balance. That's what they want to do. Yeah. We'll but help to, them through that. We, I think most folks are going to look at their budgets and want to balance sort of the performance requirements sure. between SSD and, and traditional HD. Right. Um, next question is: Is having the storage fast enough and large enough to cope with 4K data is one thing, but how does it integrate with the production workflow? Is it just a dumb device? And again, you've talked about APIs, you've talked about file management, so uh, just continue with the production yeah, workflow. I mean, it really could be, and, and I think for a lot of the creative folks, it probably should be. It should really just be an icon on their desktop so they can sort of get to work and you know, put stuff in their timeline and, 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 and be, be the creative people that they are. Now the complexity or the sophistication kind of comes in on the admin side. So that's where potentially if a media asset manager is in play, if there's delivery components in play that, that could leverage the intelligence of our solution, then I think you're going to see that happen. And we're seeing our biggest and, and brightest clients, if you will, leveraging that. So that. So I guess my question then is, are they leveraging, do they have somebody in place to manage the, the workflow from behind the scenes? Um, one thing we see a lot is, is people will install and, and get these new technologies and not have a business process to actually work with them. They, they have this big shiny new toy and it works really great, but they, they haven't developed a process internally to teach the editors and everybody how to use that. And a lot of times, there's a lot of stumbling and falling. Yeah. Uh, so is it, is it one of those things we have to go in and educate as well as sell? Do you have to go in and, and help the client develop a good business process to utilize the technology? Is the technology easy enough that you can have just one or two people behind the scenes 
and everybody that's going to sit down is going to get it pretty quick? What, I think it's going to be the, the one balance? or two people behind the scenes. Okay. So our intelligent tiering is automatic. You're not going to make a, a, a decision on indiv each individual file. I'll give you an easy example of a policy tier. If a file has not been touched for 90 days, go to LTO tape. Mm -hmm. That's something that most people can wrap their head around and, and do pull into their workflow without a lot of you know, elbow grease, if you will. And the average editor doesn't necessarily really care about something that's older than 90 days. Right. That was in the news. Well, that's are done by that. In, in, yeah. in the news, 90 days is ancient history. Sure. And, and, and also true of sports. Now, in more episodic shows, that policy might be 120 days, or it might be six months. Right, or you have separate folders, I would imagine, of media that's going to be shared from show to show. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Anything else from Quantum? Any big news? Come um, on. You know, I think uh, your yeah, we your have chance. we have a, a really exciting new product announcement announcement around um, kind of a, a, a rebranding of our of our of our line called Excellus. Okay. So what we've done is really taken the most commonly requested features from our customers and rolled it into our, our current product line and renamed it. New faceplates, you know, sort of a new software release around that. So they're supporting software around that. And I think you know one thing I wanted to just touch on in that is being able to mix topologies becomes an important component, and that's mm -hmm. an important component of this Excellus okay. release, so that I can now have NAS, IP clients, and SAN clients mixing, uh, mixing you know OSs and mixing connection topologies in the same shared storage environment. Okay. So if I need low latency access, say for a finishing station, I can have them on a fiber channel. Right. If I've got interns on proxies, I can put them on a NAS connection, and I can really mix my 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 connection topologies to. Uh, to really make the workflow more efficient from a from a budgetary standpoint as well as a bandwidth and capacity standpoint. And so we've really rolled the, all those features into our new sort of uh, selection of products uh, branded Excellus. Here's the, the, the million dollar question, shipping? Shipping, Ooh. yeah, shipping November 24th. Okay, and where can people go to find out more information? Uh, Keycodemedia.com or quantum.com. Oh, I love that, thank you. That was awesome. A great place to start. <laughs> Good place to start, keycodemedia.com. Nice. Thank you, sir. I appreciate your time. Now I'm going to talk across both of you, heading all the way down to Silent Matt, or, or Silent Eli over there. Hello. Who's been uh, been quiet. Welcome. Uh, congratulations, by the way, oh. on your Amazon relationship. We in Seattle, Thank you. we love Amazon. Let me tell you. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's, we do. We love them. But they are, uh, they're moving into our city. Significant presence. We are seeing a lot more presence. of the, uh, the Amazon workforce hitting us. So, mm -hmm. um, we're going to talk with you about uh, delivery. So the first question I've got is, uh, we're likely to see 4K over the air anytime soon. So streaming seems to be the best way consumers are going to experience 4K in the home first. What are the technical challenges of delivering 4K over the internet? Yeah, well, you know, first of all, I think we are actually seeing some 4K offerings um, over the air. So Korea Telecom has launched a 4K service over their network. Uh, you know, Rogers just announced that in 2016 they're going to be broadcasting mm -hmm. all Blue Jays home games, as well as a handful of hockey games. Uh, we see a lot of home runs in 4K. 4K is what you're saying. <laughs> yeah, I have yeah. no problem with that. Um, and then some of the some of the work we were associated with last year in terms of trials for uh, the World Cup and the Winter Olympics. Mm -hmm. um, and so those 4K workflows are being proved out. Uh, in terms of the technical challenges, one of the things that has been uh, sort of a limitation in the challenge is moving the 4K content across the network, so delivery, delivery bandwidth. Um, but even with the content providers starting to roll out gigabit offerings, uh, bandwidth is not as much of an issue anymore. I mean, even subscribers today have access to a range of between uh, 25 and 50 megabit um, on a regular basis. And so Bandwidth is becoming less and less of a challenge. And then, so from there, you sort of look at, OK, the content providers have this 4K content, getting it to their subscribers through the 4K smart TVs. And picking and choosing which TVs to build applications for is something that they, they need to figure out. And picking the, picking the right TVs to be able to build out a big enough service so that their subscribers can actually access the 4K content and make it a viable service for them. Uh, and this is the next question I'm, I'm going to gloss over a little bit because we've kind of touched on it. Yeah. We've talked about content. What's the leading content okay. for 4K? And we've kind of touched on sports, news. Uh, like you said, we see Korea. We've yeah. seen uh, Rogers, uh, our neighbors to the north. So we've seen that come through. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, I think, you know, they touched on it a little bit. Movie, cinema, film was, mm -hmm. was sort of at the forefront of that in terms of having VOD content available. Comcast and DirecTV made 
made some of those announcements at the end of last year. But I think you really go back, go back to sports in terms of having the major, the major events, the landmark flagship, you know, international events where sure. content providers and broadcasters can sort of use these events to do a big splash, a big marketing launch, and prove out right. new technology. Exactly. And then, and then as that, as that technology enters the mainstream, again, that's that's around that's around sports, it's around news, it's around the content that it's really key to be view, viewed live. And um, you know, sports is, is really compelling content to be seen in 4K at high frame rates in HDR. Yeah, we see those guys sweating and scratching themselves in 4K. That's going to be yeah, in fact, there's, there's a lot of 4K workflows being used for the HD delivery right now. You know, just tied into that. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just thinking of you watch Monday Night Football, mm -hmm. etc. When Fox does their super zoom, those are off four camera plates, okay. uh, and that's region of in, uh, interest extraction. So, you know, the the stuff is again there on the on the front end and ready to be utilized already. Mm -hmm. So I'm Joe Consumer. As I talked about earlier, I was in I was in uh, it was in Costco. Actually, it was once best was Costco uh, just yesterday, and I'm walking by and I'm looking. Like I said, it's this beautiful Samsung, like 48, 50 inch curved screen, big sign that says 4K on it. I decided I've got two grand to burn. I love that TV. I'm going to bring it home. I set it up. What am, what am I going to see as a consumer? I mean, is there anything? Is there anything I'm going to get that's worth watching right now in 4K? And how long is it going to take before that investment pays off? I mean, obviously the price is going to drop, and mm -hmm. sooner or later I'll be mad I spent two grand. Mm -hmm. But as Joe consumer right now, I'm I'm I have that technology available. So what? Where am I going? Is Comcast going to give me something? Is Rod? I mean, you talked about Rogers, but here here in the the, the lower states here, what yeah. do we see? What what? Yeah, I mean, I, Comcast and Directv both have they're both rolling out. Um, VOD movies available already. So you, you have a certain type of TV, you can, you can watch those movies. Um, and, then, and then beyond that, um, you have, um, they're looking at doing, uh, what was I going to say? Sorry. Thank you for well, there's, you got Netflix already. You have already. Netflix yeah. already, so yeah. it's, it's sort of a limited library well, yeah. that is growing. Well, there's 4K phones now. So people are shooting video, 4K video on their phones. Right? So, so pretty soon we're going to see 4K entrances, phone entrances in the Sundance, right? People are going to be... Yeah. Well, the iMovie got the 4K upgrade in the last week, right? right. To go along with the six yeah. successes. So that's... Ironically, today, a lot of the stuff is driven by our kids. Let's be real about it. As soon as that stuff arrives on their phone, on their iPad, etc., that's the They're expectation. Yeah. Uh, we were talking earlier saying YouTube drives a lot of what the youth are into. Uh, that stuff's in 4K, and that does, doesn't take more than a Wi-Fi connection to go from Apple TV or whatever to your set. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the 4K stuff at home is, is certainly available. Sony has their own little player as well with a bunch of movies. Um, but, yeah, the, I think it's going to come from a bunch of different angles at once. Yeah. Uh, I'll hit everybody. Yeah, NBC totally Universal is developing con content for Comcast to, to launch. Specifically in 4K, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's 4K. Okay. Um, you mentioned over the top, mm -hmm. I believe it was. So the next question was, how does 4K over the top delivery change the business of content providers? Increasing bandwidth costs, changes in premium service, mm -hmm. and then we talked about Netflix. Are mm -hmm. we going to see, you can buy the SD movie for $3.99, the HD for $5.99, and this 4K movie for $12.99. Yeah. You know, how is that, how is that going to change? Yeah, I mean, Netflix is a perfect example of that. You can, you can buy the standard uh, HD Netflix subscription for $7.99 or $8.99 a month. Um, and then if you want access to their 4K library, which is a little limited at this point, but growing, um, that's an extra few bucks a month. And when you're a consumer and you've just spent all this money on a 4K TV, not only is that extra few dollars a month not a huge hit to take, but it's almost something you feel obligated to do right. to be able to take advantage of your new technology. Sure. Well, then again, are we going to see your four bucks extra for Netflix and your four bucks extra for Hulu and your four bucks extra for YouTube Red and four bucks... I mean, are we going to, and then Comcast and whatever else, other service providers. So yeah. you're gonna, we're going to see some nickel and diming going on. It sounds like as, as we grow into this technology, until everybody comes together, and it's just, it's just there. Yeah. Available. And then mm -hmm. 8K or 12K. That's probably the biggest. Smacks us in the head yeah. next. It's probably yeah. the biggest business battle going on right now. Yeah, you know, I was reading this morning. Stars has already seen more over the top subscriptions than the subscriptions they lost of typical broadcast. Of course, Apple TV. Who knows where that goes? This is just a entry volume, right? Amazon and everything going on mm -hmm. around here, 
these are all huge investments. I don't know that the battle per se has been won. It's just everyone's engaging and trying to figure out how do people want to watch it. Mm -hmm. I think for us as creatives, for your audience, people that are buying product from you, the bottom line is the production needs to be made. And there's clearly a huge thirst. So if you're doing stuff today in HD and you think there's any longevity to that product, I would highly encourage you to start capturing in 4K because ultimately it's just like film was years ago. You know, uh, folks were shooting on film not because they thought SD was great. They were thinking, well, I can resell the same show when the next wave of technology comes along. And I think for, for your audience, that's a really key element. Is future proofing. It's future proofing. Yeah. Money's always been in future proofing and repackaging the same materials. Yeah, so there'll, there'll be an expansion of different tiers of models. And yeah, really at that point, it's, it's the subscribers uh, choosing which services to pick and choose from until it becomes more of a, a package bundle deal. Um, but I think the content providers generally see it as an opportunity. There is a big upfront cost in terms of expanding their, their broadband bandwidth requirements. Um, but you know, with those, with those expanded pipes, that allows them to offer new applications, uh, new services to, to their subscribers for value added, value added propositions. Speaking of which, next question. Speed, cost, quality. Uh, which of which two of these three have been the most important for 4K providers so far? <laughs> I know you can't say all three. Speed, cost, quality. Pick I won't, two. I won't say all three. So, because 4K is so new, um, and because the content providers are really pushing, I would say that the two that have predominantly been what we've seen are quality and speed. Yep. Now that's because um, because we're going to make up the cost. Is that? Well, I mean, it, honestly, it's it, it really comes back to the newness. So yeah. they, they want to get their offerings out, and so speed plays a huge factor into that. Mm -hmm. And then they want to make sure those offerings um, are the highest quality video as to you, make them as you talked about to earlier, make yeah. them mm -hmm. compelling content. Now, that's sort of the trend with with new launches, and then cost, you know, eventually over time plays a bigger and bigger role. Um, it could overtake one or two of those, or or sort of balance out the three of them. But cost definitely with the newness of 4K has taken a little bit of a back seat. Um, and that, that's sort of application dependent too, but that's what, that's what we've seen. But you're seeing the content economy, I think you alluded to it earlier, where you're gonna get, you have choices now between SD and HD. They're just gonna add a third tier to that economy right. and yeah. mm -hmm. you're gonna pay a few dollars more if you wanna see that, that film in 4K. Mm -hmm. um, speaking of delivery, mm -hmm. something we talked about a little bit beforehand was uh, YouTube. And I have an 11-year-old who is a huge YouTube fan. I mean, she is, she watches TV. We have a couple of shows we watch, but she is just all over YouTube. And, and, and that is, those are her celebrities. Those are her stars. It's not when we were growing up, you know, watching Hulk Hogan and, and you know, <laughs> Sylvester Stallone. Those, those were our stars, but they were movie and TV stars. Her, her celebrities now are, are these, these YouTube personalities that have popped up. So last question is, is when do you think internet will overtake cable? and satellite as the primary delivery method for video content uh, to the home. Yeah, I mean, I think we're, we're already seeing those trends now. Um, we sort of talk about, when we talk about the massive trends in the video industry, we sort of divide it into three layers. We have uh, the video processing workflow moving from hardware, dedicated hardware, to software-based systems. Now, that can be software running on off-the-shelf appliances or virtual machines or in the cloud. Um, but really a software-defined video network. Um, and then you have the, what, is, what is being looked at by the content providers as the primary screen they're delivering to. And really, historically, traditionally, that's been uh, the tethered TV in the home. Mm -hmm. And while that's still very important to deliver to, the mobile experience in terms of making business decisions is really driving a lot of the future for the content providers. And then third, to kind of go back to your question, uh, the, the distribution network is moving from coax and over the air to, to an IP-based distribution system. And so you know, we're seeing some of that. Comcast has already come out and publicly stated that they're moving in that direction. They're going to IP. Um, and I don't remember, Matt or Bryce mentioned that you know, sub these, these providers are seeing subscribers, more subscribers in, for their broadband uh, subscriptions than they are in the TV. So, you know, before it really sets in, it might be, it might be a couple of years, but it's really not 
not the too not distant future. Yeah. No. The key, th the key thing in this way we kind of live at the moment in terms of a company like ours is to bridge those two worlds. Because again, it's, it's about if you're doing professional work and it's got to be on air and it's got to work for the over the top stuff, it's still about frame rates, it's still about audio sync. You'd be amazed at how much stuff goes wrong with audio sync in the IP environment. Um, and those are real world challenges. So we're at, we're, we're at a transition point, um, but it's great that it's all moving along quickly. And again, tools like ours, like our basic I.O. cards, are being utilized for streaming all over the place, whether it's with vMix, whether it's with uh, Telestream's Wirecast products. It doesn't matter. For us, it's, it's just another uh, delivery mechanism again, ultimately. Um, and it's pretty amazing because to take an I.O. card like those, which can work in your Mac, you got four SDIs, well you just plug four cameras in. That can be four HD cameras. Or you utilize the four for 4K and you're already doing 4K live streaming right now for peanuts. So in terms of... Not peanuts, folks, no. It's, it's, it's an investment, trust me. Well, <laughs> we'll help you through that investment. Let's put it another way. A reasonably <laughs> priced solution for getting what go. your client needs. Yeah. And, you know, and I think that's the thing is, is uh, most of us got into this business because we like to create things. And the, the tools right now are incredibly flexible between the software hardware combinations because elemental stuff is still going to have some hardware doing some of that crunching. It's going to run on something. Yeah. yeah. There's going to be compression that's required, et cetera. I think you're seeing it on both sides of the fence. Just to add to that, I think you're seeing that IP is, become all, is becoming a de facto standard for production mm -hmm. and no longer sending trucks in the traditional sense as much, right. as much as it is delivery, right? Mm -hmm. Instead of over the air necessarily, it's, it's being delivered via IP. I think we're really going to see a shift equally on the production side, where right. production's going to convert from a video circuit to an IP circuit, if you will. Sure. Any final thoughts from the three of you? Any concerns? Looking to the future, anything you see coming up, a trend you might think that's exciting. Uh, we're going to get to some questions here. We've got some good ones. We've got some questions. Uh, the hashtag <laughs> is it's hashtag 4K crazy. If you want to tweet us and send us a question, a couple of these are brilliant. But uh, just to wrap it up, any any last thoughts, concerns, comments? 4K. No, I just think it's it's very real. It's very now. If you're not taking it seriously, you're going to get run over pretty quick. Uh, you need to be in it. It's, it's no longer an either or. Uh, from the software on up through the hardware. I think it's very exciting. I don't think it's anything to be scared of between the compression standards that are already occurring right from the capture source on. It's not that big a deal to deal with. Not a big learning curve. No, you just need to be smart. And I, th and I think between the, the various groups we have sitting here at this table, there are a lot of real world solutions. They're not stupidly priced. Sure. Uh, and, and I think you should be thinking about it right from the get-go. Uh, even if you're going to continue to live HD for a while, no reason not to make sure that your investment's going to take you forward. Well, and to, to echo that, I think that you, you're not just preparing for 4K, you're preparing for 8K and 12K and, and potentially the, the higher bit rates and higher, higher color depths so right. of, that production's going to require. The, 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 the average consumer is going to expect higher quality video when 4K comes, not right. just more lines. Yep. Yeah, and I think like, you know, it, it doesn't need to be that scary to take on when it is when they are software-based systems. So that's one of our main value propositions: is you can you can invest in Elemental and know that as new codecs come out, um, as new color depths come out, new resolutions, they can just upgrade their software and and support that future wave of technology. So it, it's it's not as scary a leap as it needs to be. Outstanding. So, hashtag 4K crazy, a couple questions. First one from Red Frazier. How do storage requirements inform 4K camera choices, and do those need to be considered first? Who wants to tackle it? Uh, I'll take a stab at that. So, I mean, the Kodak, Kodak is one of the first questions we ask when we talk to a customer about their workflow. And if you look at a lot of production companies, they have an easier choice because they can sort of standardize on a, on a, on a codec. A lot of post-production facilities are going to have any number of codecs walk through the door. So depending on your business need, you know, yes, you need to, to think about the codec from the ground up, from the camera, really, you know, glass to glass, right? You're going to be thinking about a codec. Because on the back side, you're not going to be delivering 4K to a lot of phones just yet, right? It might come in the door 4K, but it might go out the door and a lower resolution and a lower bit rate to hit the consumer. 
So I think you're going to be thinking about that codec from not just the acquisition component, but but the delivery component as well. All right, here the <laughs> Matt McLean wants to know how close to my 4K TV do I need to sit to see true 4K? How close? <laughs> Uh, how far? Let's, 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 <laughs> let's, let's go ahead and thanks, Matt. That was good. Good one. Um, but you talked about screen size actually yeah. earlier, and, you, and and when we talked about going out purchasing 4K, what what's an optimal viewing size for for a 4K? If you're going to sit down, if you're going to advise somebody, hey, I've I've managed the workflow. Now I've gotten it to you. How are you going to best enjoy it? Oh, you you can sit closer uh, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> Uh, I think the key thing is, is you know, when you stand back is uh, often where people go, I can't see the difference between the HD and the 4K, and that's why you're getting a bigger screen for that clarity. You know, a, another thing that I, w I think should be emphasized here is not like the sets themselves are dumb. And what I mean by that is if you go out and buy a typical Samsung, what have you today, LG, you're paying, I bought mine for 600 bucks already, they really dropped that much. The fact is they also have chips in them that up res your HD. So it's kind of like, I wouldn't freak out that much if there's not a lot of 4K content at this very moment in time. I can tell you right now, my NFL stuff every Sunday is looking a hell of a lot better than it did on my prior set. Yeah. So there are chips in there that are already up resing that, that HD input. Um, so it's, it's a decent investment. But th the bottom line is, uh, you do want to be 55, 65, more or less, to really feel it. Uh, and then you can be as close and as far as you want in a typical size room, and it's just going to feel good. 8K, I, th I think, is, is something that maybe makes more sense for the larger live environments. Um, I'm still waiting to see a compelling argument as to why I would invest in that for home. Yeah. Um, and HDR, and I think that's why some of the software companies like Adobe are looking at HDR as being perhaps a bigger factor. Uh, within the next couple of years. I mean, so I think somewhere, a place where very high resolution like 8K could play a role is virtual reality. Yep. And something that's right up against, that's, that's you know, your eyes are right up against that screen and it's, it's a surround experience. Right, you split it down into two fours for the two eyes anyway. Mm -hmm. right. mm -hmm. Dwayne Abler is asking, uh, is anyone considering a consumer, a consumer disc based 4K system for delivery? I'm not quite sure I'm getting that. So like a Blu-ray, 4K Blu-ray? I'm similar? guessing that's what he's going for, yeah. Some yeah. kind of consumer That's 4K. already coming. Yeah. 4K Blu-ray is on the way. Who are we going to see that from? Is that? Well, it's a typical alliance. Blu-ray is, is part of an alliance, and it's, it's the same group of companies. How soon? How soon before oh. I can throw in Watchmen? Or, huh. I don't know, something that, a Speed Racer, if you've ever yeah. watched. Not a great movie, but color-wise, holy cow. Um, is, I, is that something consumers are going to be able to get uh, see soon? Now they're going to have their their SD, their Blu-ray, and their 4K. Yeah, and the four, the 4K Blu-ray devices that are being talked about, I haven't seen a hard date announcement, but they backwards compatible, of course, so you can play your standard HD Blu-ray. But I, I think what's more likely is again your iPhone, your iPad, where the screen's already done it, and you don't need the device. Your device is simply playing back a, a stream file. It's a conduit to the screen at that point. Yeah. You know, an HDMI coming out of an iPad that's going to be able to deliver 4K more efficiently, likely than a right. than a piece of polybicarbonate, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, on that, uh, from Joe Masta, how comparable will 4K DVD be versus streaming versus 4K if, uh, versus HD streaming? Why pay more for streaming 4K when it may look like just old streaming HD? Well, that depends on the compression choices chosen, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Yeah, and that's where HEVC comes into play, and having the highest quality, uh, the highest quality bit rate you can for your bandwidth, um, and again, screen size is going to play a big role in that as well. So, um, mobile phones, tablets don't really make a lot of sense when you get into PCs and certain screen sizes. Mm -hmm. That's where it starts to play a factor, and then the smart TVs, of course. Um, but yeah, the compression algorithm, making sure, sure there's enough bandwidth to access those, those high bit rates to support 4K and HEVC, that's, those are the keys. Mike Cavanaugh asks, what are most standard 4K accepted compressed deliverables? Are you, you're talking HEVC, are you talking in, in terms of, that sounds like to the home or to the, the final uh, destination, right? 
So in that case, it's definitely HEVC. Mm. Our Corbett HEVC was shown at uh, IBC running in a coming Cisco box. Um, and that type of thing, it was pretty fabulous, so, you know, up on a decent sized screen. It was actually a hard demo to get people to understand because they came by, they saw the stuff coming out of the camera, and they looked at the screen and they assumed it was actually live off the camera. Because HEVC, when implemented well, it's pretty darn hard with you know, an average eye to tell the difference between that and the original source. Um, and that's part of the difficulty I, I I'm aware of right now going on for the broadcasters is just choosing that bandwidth, mm -hmm. right, the megabits per second. And going back to that little, that question you had a little earlier, that will vary because with something like a Blu-ray 4K, and that's always been the difference between Blu-ray at home versus your iTunes account, right? Uh, you might vary from four megabits per second in the HD case all the way up to 20 or something. Yeah. And it'll be the same thing with 4K. So you're, you're paying a little bit more, but you are getting more of that bandwidth, and therefore it's clearly a, a richer image. Last question we have um, is from Alan Maynard, who apparently is a Hulk Hogan fan. Uh, he says, color standards for 4K UHD. That's his question, color standards. 4K UHD color standards. Well, SMPT has them already, right? Um, so there's 2020 and there's, there's 425, and. Uh, they're in place, it's all a matter of, of people actually implementing them over the next couple of years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, Elemental, we implemented HDR support for those other, the color spaces. Um, Roger's announcement, when they're, when they're launching 4K, they're going to tie HDR into that. Um, so it's, it's really just making sure the whole workflow on the, the editing side supports, supports the, those color spaces as well. And that's kind of one of the challenges we've had is producing content ourselves and figuring out all the color spaces and making sure the proper data gets passed through right. at each point. Weakest link in the chain will kill you on that one. Absolutely. Gentlemen, I think that's all the time we have. Uh, thank you very much for being here with us. Thank you for thank you. joining us at Ray's in this amazing view. We're going to go have some lunch. Yes. We're going to let these guys <laughs> clean up. Um, anybody that's left on the, on the stream, thank you for being here as well. We appreciate you taking the time to be with us. Um, we are Key Code Media. Any questions, comments, please let us know. We're here to, to we work with these guys. We're here to work with you and help you with your 4K workflow. Thank you for your time, and uh, I think we're out. Thanks, we'll see you all again. Thank, Thank you. Thanks for having us.